I wasn't too surprised when we matched. In my bio, I mentioned that I worked as a kennel tech, which the specific job of caring for the puppies sold by the store. And in her bio, the topmost point was that potential dates must get along well with dogs. <laughs> As an icebreaker, I asked her what was the weirdest or most eccentric thing about her, and her response wasn't too weird. So I chalked it up as, ha, aren't I so quirky kind of thing. Uh, she said, I don't let my dogs around other dogs when we're out on walks because I'm kind of afraid he'll give away a house secrets. <laughs> so my response was, compared to hers, fairly tame. I told her I can't walk by a door that is open or even barely ajar without closing it. Now, she didn't criticize my compulsion. And although she didn't share it, she sympathized with the overall idea of being annoyed or frustrated by things that are left unfinished. Only a few messages later, I decided to shoot my shot, and I asked her out. Now, there's a bookstore not far from my house, so I offered to buy her a cup of coffee and a snack, and she enthusiastically accepted, with the only caveat being that we wear masks. Now, I had no issue with this. The bookstore required it anyway. Thirty minutes later, we were sitting across from each other, chatting, and in my case, sipping coffee. <laughs> I bought her one as well, but she merely kept her hand wrapped around it for warmth, saying she'd drink it later, when it wasn't so hot. I figured that despite her willingness to meet up, she was still a bit hesitant to unmask herself around a stranger, which was absolutely fine, you know, with me. I showed her the pictures of the puppies that I take care of at work, allowing her to swipe through the images to her convenience, which I thought was a good way to help her relax, considering that most guys would probably print out pictures from their phone rather than pass it over, uh, you know, if they could. So she smiled, laughed, and she asked questions, having a preference for shepherds and huskies. Generally gave the impression that she was enjoying herself. Well, after about an hour, um, when the cup was empty and hers had yet to be touched, she got up and said that she was ready to go. Thinking the date was over, I thanked her for her time, prepared to browse some books, happy that I had at least gotten a pleasant conversation out of the meeting. But uh, as I pushed away from the table... She put her hand on mine and said, The masks stay on during sex. Twenty minutes later, she was leading me into her apartment. We crossed the foyer in a small living room where a dosh hound sat on the couch in front of the TV. I'd often leave the TV on for my Bichon, but rarely did he pay as much attention as it did the dosh hound seemed to be. The little guy was lying back on the couch with his little legs slumped against his belly, a half-chewed treat on the couch beside him. As we crossed in front of the TV, his little head followed us, but not even a questioning bark escaped his mouth, and my date merely waved at him as she led me towards the bedroom. Given the importance she'd placed on dogs in her profile and the glee she'd shown when looking at the pictures I'd taken, I expected her room to be obsessively decorated in all things dog, but it was a fairly normal millennial woman's bedroom. She pointed towards the bed with an air of dominance that she hadn't before expressed, and nudged the bedroom door with her foot, almost closing it. Once she noticed my slight cringe that I honestly tried to hide, she shut the door completely and apologized, then climbed into bed beside me. I brushed it off as nothing, even as I fought the urge to go check to make sure that it had been closed all the way. A few moments later, we were undressing, all clothing except for masks, of course, tossed haphazardly around the room. Her curtains were closed, blocking out the diminishing sunlight, but there were purple and pink Christmas lights strung up along the walls for the purpose of establishing what I can only imagine as she called a chill vibe. There was a picture of her dosh hound that saved me. On a bedside table was a picture of the aforementioned pup sitting in her lap outside what looked to be a cabin somewhere. But the contents of the picture aren't important. It's what dimly reflected by the glass that caught my eye. Just as she wrapped her arms around me, right before the act had begun, I saw her closet door reflected in the glass. The closet door was ajar. I turned away, my horniness immediately overridden by the neurotic impulse, the ajar closet door like a fire that I had to put out. Just as this happened, my elbow inadvertently brushed against her maybe collided with her head. Despite the previous overpowering sensation, I'm not an asshole. I immediately turned back to make sure she was all right, and I saw that it had knocked her mask off. 
and immediately began a litany of apologies, but abruptly stopped halfway through the third, I'm so sorry. Because I finally got a look at what was beneath the mask. The area of her face she'd been so adamant about concealing. It wasn't a normal mouth. It wasn't even a disfigured one. Hell, I would have been fine with a toothless, gummy grin, a third nostriled nose, maybe even one of those freaky yet kind of enticing forked tongues. Anything, so long as it was identifiably human. This girl. This girl I'd spent most of the day with. This girl with whom I was only seconds, mere inches away from having sex with had instead had the diminutive snout of a dog beneath her mask. She screamed, or rather yelped, but not from an unintentional elbow blow. She'd recovered just fine from that and was hastily trying to refasten her mask around her face. I scrambled away and fell off the bed, terrified beyond sense. Somehow, perhaps through a subconsciously driven automation of body, I crawled backwards and happened to shut the closet door, but there was no relief from this action with the hound woman only a few feet away. She had remained on the bed and only addressed the issue of her dog face. When she'd finally gotten her mask back on, she beckoned me to return to the bed, saying that the snout was a birth defect, some, some sort of ultra-rare yet harmless genetic anomaly. And yet, as she said this, her dog mouth slavered hungrily, creating a truly abhorrent visage of cross-species mania. Total bullshit. Not believing any of it, I darted around the room in search of my clothes, but only managed to find my t-shirt and pants before the bedroom door opened and the dosh hound walked in. Hey, Sarah, heard you shout. This guy hurt you? The Dawshan looked at me, eyes heavily lidded with body language that bore without question the subtle posture of a slightly alarmed human being. Sure, he was on all fours, yet despite his quadrupant stance, there was an inexpressible humanity in the way he stood. I screamed like a madman when he spoke again, this time saying, Hey, buddy, what'd you do? With a dexterity that I'm surprised was possible, giving flight of terror... I leapt over him, landed in the hall beyond the door, and kicked it shut behind me without halting or significantly altering my stride. Before I had even entered the living room, I heard vicious barking issue from within the closed bedroom, and now that I'm reflecting back on the experience, I'm absolutely certain the savage sounds had been made by two different voices. I've made it out of there with a fragment of my sanity. I would have escaped that warped mongrel nightmare without having any need to attend therapy sessions after therapy session if I hadn't noticed the slightly ajar door in the kitchen. My nerves warred with me, those wired for survival screaming at me to leave and those born of compulsive neurosis arguing, hey, we can't leave that door open, can we? I'm sure you can guess which side won out. The kitchen was only a few feet away, so I, I jumped over the coffee table and another two steps I was at the door. But before I could close it, before I could finally put an end to that utterly insane day, inside of this domain of the dog people, I saw something ascending the stairs. I automatically opened the doors. Anyone would have automatically done for someone below them in that situation, but I wish with all of my heart that I hadn't. Because the person coming up the stairs wasn't a person like I was. I mean, they walked upright, sure. They climbed the steps in typical human bipedal fashion. But they were entirely nude, covered in short brown fur, their head. Oh god, their loathsome head. It was the reverse of my dates. Rather than the top half of their face being human, theirs was canine with a human mouth in place of a snout. The floppy ears of the dog perked up in an expression of slight surprise, while a human mouth sipped a drink through a straw. Our eyes met, and without showing any real shock at my entirely human appearance, the bestial stranger said, Oh, you must be the new guy. Has she let you pick out your collar yet? With a force that might have been a bit excessive, I slammed the door in their face. I heard a splash, presumably some of the drink falling to the floor as they recoiled away in surprise, and only a moment later I heard the deeply unsettling sounds of a tongue lapping up the liquid that had landed on the wooden stairs. 
I turned around and fled, but made one final frightful observation before bolting out of the house. On a rack beside the front door were six collars, all with names. All of the names were mailed. My date, apparently, was the owner of the brood. I had only met two of the four dogs. I refuse to imagine in what state of anthropomorphic de-evolution or grotesquerie canine mutations the other four were in. Obviously, I unmatched her on the dating app once I'd driven a comfortable distance away. You can only speculate about what might have happened to me if I'd had sex with her. Perhaps, perhaps she would have placed some sort of transformative spell on me mid-act, or maybe the mere act of having sex would have initiated the usurpation of my humanity. I don't know. I have no intention of finding out by going back to that site of zoological abominations. The only good thing to come from the dreadful experience was the total erasure of my compulsion. I mean, I have no problem with doors being left open now that I've developed a maddening fear of dogs. Including my own cute, fluffy, and entirely innocent pup. Who was asleep in front of the TV when I returned home. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy-based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepypasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Gordon Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.